I'm very happy to be here on my uh, first visit to Canada and also my first presentation in English in this big conference. I, I hope you, you will enjoy this presentation. And my, na um, I, uh, my name is Kyoko Takeuchi and my pronouns, pronounces are they, them, although I'm not so comfortable about this pronunciation because I, I don't use English in everyday life. And I, um, okay. Um, I, I got, I'm, I major in sociology and I got my the PhD last, actually last week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I, I'm also a member of the X gender community, Level X in Japan. X gender is a term that refers to the non binary gender identity, as I will explain later. And my um, and my experience in this uh, Level X community affect the uh, research interests of me, and um, and then my research focus is on the history of non binary identity categories in Japan, and I've explored it in my PhD dissertation. So today I will summarize the previous studies of transgender histories in Japan first and then explain the way of self-positioning of ex-gender affected by community knowledge mainly based on my dissertation. Um, it is said that very few transgender histories in East Asia have been explored uh, but some works on transgender histories in Japan have been written in Japanese, although the number is not so many. For example, uh, Mitsuhashi Junko has depicted the history of cross-dressing communities in the post-war Japan. Moreover, the practices of trans people who try to show their masculinity or femininity in trans community have been explored. And on the contrary to this practice, uh, according to Ishii Yukari, trans people in Japan have come to avoid the binary gender norms and pursue their distinct self-identity recently. However, these studies uh, don't focus on the histories of non-binary communities. The almost the only research on one of the non-binary categories X gender is by Sonia Peifian Dale. According to the Dale's work, X gender is used solely in Japan and basically used by people who think they are not a man or a woman and its definition is open to individuals. X gender has subcategories, chusei, musei, ryosei, and futeisei. And based on these studies, I'm more interested in how X gender's meanings have been changed across time and space and how ex-gender individuals have used the term ex-gender for self-positioning. Therefore, I've explored the history of non-binary identity categories in Japan in my PhD dissertation. Uh, in Japan, the term transgender was imported from the US in the 1990s, although the terms like gay boy and blue boy were used before that. Uh, in this period, very few people had used over gender and inter gender in the cross dressing communities. But the, the non binary practice was not visible because, at the same moment, the treatments under the medical concept of gender identity disorder have been started. Only in the Kansai region, the category ex gender was used in the form of FTX, female to X, and MTX, male to X. And this was partly because of the leader, Morita Shinichi, who identified as MTFTX. However, around 2001, when the category gender identity disorder became prevalent in the media coverage, and a lot of trans people who tried to transition their gender in a binary way became visible in the community, the place for exogenda people changed to online and beyond the Kansai area. 
And since 2010, X-Gender has come to be known in the media and SNS, such as Twitter, and some X-Gender people attempted to define X-Gender as a response to the criticism toward X-Gender from other trans people. I think this short-term history, about uh, 30 years history of the category, would affect the way of X-Gender people's self-positioning. So my research question is how X-Gender people in Japan have positioned themselves under the X-Gender, referring to the multi-layered knowledge and, and the vocabulary available in the groups. And in doing so, I view categories as being formed in the process of interaction, such as categories bringing about norms and changing the methods of self-understandings, and the responses from people changing the meaning of categories by using community knowledge. I think the practice of using categories has been important for non-binary people living in a Japanese society with strong binary norms. And as a research method, I collected as many magazines and internet texts, such as personal homepage and web, archive, uh, web articles written in trans people as possible. Uh, you can find the, one of these um, magazines, FTM Nihon, uh, in the archives in, in this university. And they are all written in Japanese, mainly from the 1980s to around 2010, in order to express their identity and political claims. And in addition, I conducted interviews with 29 gender non-conforming people, including uh, people ident who identify themselves as exogender and transgender and so on. And in the analysis of this text, I focused on what kind of com community activities and knowledge were associated with the use of the categories in the text. Um, I, I think you can't see <laughs> the text, but I, uh, I want to show the diversity of my informants. Um, the, and I use san after each name, like a san, b san, she san, in order not to gender their names. And you can see various expressions uh, uh, up in referring to their gender identity. For example, a san says, uh, they, they is not a woman and a human, and also masculine, ex gender, and so on. And then I shall explain the result of the analysis. Um, I think exogender can be characterized as a subcategory of transgender and also as a distinct category different from transgender. First, I found that some exogender people identify themselves as FTX or MTX in the context of the Kansai region in Japan in the late 1990s, especially in the group G Fronto Kansai. FTX and MTX categories were used in the glossary of the group magazine as neither FTM nor MTF. For example, H-san, who was a member of the g Fronto Kansai, still uses FTX transgender as their gender identity. According to H-san, uh, X as referring to other, enabling them to separate themselves from being a woman FTM and also Dai San no Se, third gender. Um, I, I think I, I don't have time to read uh, this interview text, uh, but in this interview, H San's narrative is related to the memory of the interaction in the community, G Fronto Kansai. And, but even in G Fronto Kansai, H San was viewed as an FTM or a man or Dai San no Sei, third gender. So H San managed to use FTX to show that they was not those identities. And it is said that Jifuron to Kansai was a relatively queer place where normative gender was less self-evident than in other trans groups. In the early 2000s, when X gender was spreading through the internet, in some trans groups, 
X gender X was signified as a concept that represented people who did not undergo hormone therapy or surgery under the norms of changing their body in a binary way. And in the group that Yuito-san joined, FTX was often viewed as a condition in which uh, condition in which a person wanted treatment, medical treatment, but had not yet undergone it, unlike FTM. So exgender people tended to think that they were not enough as a transgender. On the other hand, some informants think of exgender as a distinct category, different from transgender. Those informants knew exgender in the two, uh, in the 2010s when exgender became prevalent as a category with ambiguous meanings that can be defined by individuals mainly in the SNS, especially Twitter. And the first practice enabled by this uh, category exgender can be uh, characterized as disconnecting the self from the existing categories like transgender, which tended to be thought of as a similar category to gender identity disorder. And the second practice is using exgender to get a tentative sense of belonging, viewing exgender as an identity that can be changeable easily. So Ethan says, for now, I'm exgender, but when gender equality is achieved, I can be a woman. And Visa also says, uh, I feel like I'm keeping exgender in my temporary position all the time. And this, uh, Ethan and Visa think, and this can be possible by the ambiguous definition of exgender. However, this ambiguity sometimes leads to making the meaning of exgender more rigid. For example, if Sun says, since X is diverse, it is difficult to explain to society through the, cap uh, the category of X that we want to receive proper medical care for our atypical gender identity. Then Epson decided to use non-binary, of course from the word non-binary, uh, which was imported in the 2010s through, through the translated internet articles focusing on people who get institutional support, such as X in the passport, mainly in Europe and North America. It seems that Epson considered tightening up the meaning of X agenda as, as desirable, due to the lack of institutional support for non-binary individuals in Japan. And in conclusion, I have shown the complex multi-layered practices in which individuals position themselves under the categories based on their experiences in groups and online networks. Um, by doing so, we can understand the discrepancies in the meaning of, of exgender that is a subcategory of transgender in the trans community in the Kansai region, and also an ambiguous open category in the 2010s that are distinct from the trans category transgender. And the latter meaning of exgender enabled people to differentiate themselves from existing categories to self-position temporarily and to make the meaning more rigid. Although these practices sometimes cause a conflict among exgender individuals. And this, uh, these are the references. And I'd like to explore more about the uh, prevalence of non binary categories in, in Japan recently and also the personal history of each exgender individuals. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can get these slides from this QR code. Uh, I, 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 don't see, I don't know, you can see, see this, it's very small, <laughs> but so sorry. But thank you very much for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Xian Sal, and I'm doing my MA in here at UBIC, and I will talk about kind of the beginnings of my thesis and kind of middle way through. So understanding non-binary individuals in Turkey, a focus on language. 
So uh, this is my outline. I will focus on background of Turkey. Oh, Turkey changed their name to Turkey. Yeah? I am adopting that name change, and hopefully that will fix everything. But uh, so, <laughs> thank you for laughing. <laughs> But uh, I will give some context and I will talk about non-binary literature in Turkey, which will be short. Uh, focus and I will focus on language in the last bits. So Turkey is uh, in between Europe and Middle East and has affected from both of them. And in Turkey, there is only 81 major cities and no uh, provinces or states. So this is important because the country is under only one civil law at the national level. And so if there's a like legal transgender recognition, it should be like if it's happening, it should happen in the whole country. And there is uh, in 1980, 1986 with Blantar Soy, a very famous singer, uh, transgender recognition starts to happen by her fightings in court. And since then, in Turkey, after very long procedures of like medical and legal fights, like after two, three years maybe, you can actually start to get your transitions. Uh, and one thing is, it's very, very binary, and there's no bi uh, non-binary recognition in Turkey. So when we talk about social aspects, hegemonic masculinity is very, very predominant, and in Turkey it's defined as heterosexual, authoritarian, conservative, culturally Muslim, middle to high class, and Turkish, as opposed to Kurdish identity, and in culturally dominant roles of gender dichotomy between men and women inscribe themselves on one's sexuality, and this is important because gender identity and sexual orientation starts to very blur, and it's always been blurred, and Turkey, so when I'm using some terms, it might be not only for gender identity. And I will get into a bit more. So, a bit of history, because I want to start with history, because it shows that it's not a lineal modernization of understanding when we talked about especially gender identity. So in 1858, uh, the law of the Ottoman Empire uh, have no longer contains explicit articles criminalizing homosexuality. And historian Hirschfeld says that sexual orientation called after for a few hours of pleasure and gender fluidity was not uncommon. But in the late 19th century, the westernization of Ottoman culture accelerated and homosexuality and gender fluidity among Turkish men became a problem for modernizers. So, through the history of Ottoman Empire, gender diversity, like very much many different gender expressions were actually existent. I put two examples of it, Kyocek and Zenne. They're both assigned male peoples at birth, but like usually grow up in a more feminine attire and have much education, especially Kyocek has traditionally has so many educations and use both a feminine and masculine land in their lives and they're both usually seen in like festivals and in like weddings and they are like uh, has occupations as like feminine dancers. Zenna is today more used for like belly dancers, male belly dancers, but very much in a feminine attire. So again in here we can see that this like gender and sexual orientation is very much blurring but they were existing. That's the an important thing. So very fastly moving forward, in 2003, uh, as I said, like after changes in 18s and in 80s and 90s, uh, in 2003 there was like this big uh, 30 people uh, first gay pride happened. Very bri uh, brave uh, 30 people uh, gathered in Istanbul. And in like 10, 15 years, there's actually numbers are grown so big that in 2014, uh, it was the biggest yet for in Southeastern Europe. Uh, that was with like more than 100,000 people gathered to lead the pride. And this was a very important point because with the Occupy moments in 2013, this time, the first time of like Turkish history that like actually parties were involved and like Kurdish party and the main opposition party led their sports to LGBT people that are going through the pride and having like 
literally the sport and feeling that sport. But so things are not going that great after those times. In 2015 and 16, we were kind of the marking of like started going a bit backwards. And with the 2021, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, decided to withdraw from the uh, Istanbul Convention, which is one of the important uh, conventions that's been signed in the European Union, technically, literally signed in Istanbul against uh, violence against women plus people. But uh, apparently that's woman plusness and like having all these uh, gender identity and sexual uh, orientation categories in the convention uh, was incompatible with Turkey's social and family values. So it happened the withdrawals and there's still uh, very much discussions today saying that it was unconstitutional. So, after talking about these backgrounds, non-binary people and Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, people who identify their gender experiences outside of the binary gender categories use different terms to explain their gender. So, Turkish, and I love that in this presentation, I'm like, I was taking notes and I hear lots of things about like how internationally this is actually a very interesting topic. And then Turkey is one of the countries that is very much trying to deal with coming up with their own terms versus using terms from the West in like English. So in Turkish, uh, like modern queer history is usually borrowed their terms from English, like queer for queer, lesbian for lesbian, non-binary is start to be in use uh, for non-binary, which is a literally Turkish written way of written it. Um, so, non-binary literature in Turkey. This uh, brochure that you're seeing the cover is right now the only publication that is written about non-binary people in Turkish, in whole Turkey, in like to the, up to the, today. And in the beginning of that 81 page brochure, when you put in like literally only written, it's like 10 page. Uh, brochure is like starts with Eskaus GL or Association, which is one of the oldest and biggest uh, LGBTQ organizations in Turkey. We are here with the new thematic brochures we have published to address the identities whose rights, problems and demands are the least voiced within the LGBTI movement. So in here, I want to say that like, it says that it's least voiced, but it's still existing. So it's real, like it was existing like all along. Uh, and one of the questions that was very much striking to me in question and answers uh, portion of the brochure was, even the concept is in English is non-binary. It's an uh, is non-binary a Western imitator? And you'll the start the editor of the brochure answers that, for example, the word heterosexual is a word that has been passed into our language from English. While not suggesting that heterosexuality is a Western imitation, or why should we argue that being non-binary or LGBTI plus is a Western imitation, or right? So with this, I think it's very important to see, that's actually why I want to start with a very brief introduction of like the LGBT history in Ottoman Empire too, because it makes like the importance for the people's existence in Turkey as their identities saying that like, hey, we've been here before, with like gender diverse, non-binary, gender queer people were here, whatever label that were used at that time, there were still beyond people living beyond the gender binaries. So, with this, let's start talk about Turkish language. Uh, Turkish does not have grammatical gender. Human nouns and pronouns usually do not indicate whether the person referred is male or female. In Turkish, we use like, oh, ekul and for she, he, she, it. Uh, still, there is a significant presence of semantically implied gender covered uh, in Turkish, but in the language in itself, in grammaticals, there is no gender, which I really enjoy to put this, uh, Google translations of some of the sentences. I find it amazingly, uh, shows lots of things about the society. And the first two lines is like, obir which means like, they're a cook, translated as like, she is a cook, and obir doktor translates as he's an engineer. <laughs> And when we look at the last three of them, o evli, 
they are married is like she is married, Obekar, he is single. And he is happy, she is unhappy, he is hardworking, she is lazy. Translation is such a fun thing. And uh, well, Google, after many of tweets and retweets, and I think last year, changed this and starts to use more gender neutral and using like slash or something like this can be this or that. But in the process, that was for years happening. And continuing with translation, so one of the problems that uh, we're encountering studying non-binary uh, identities in Turkish is there is very much limited translations. So I give very, very like the encounter, the, the problem that I'm encountering with my like supervisors and like talking with people in here was like, you're using these terms interchangeably and I'm like, because they are in my language. So this is very hard for me to sometimes navigate and I'm like non-binary people in Turkey also having very hard time to navigate. Here's this research. So sex, uh, this translation is jinsiyet and when we look up word to word, it's sex and gender, when we translate it, it's toplumsal jinsiyet, and it becomes word of our translation, social sex. So we don't have a word for gender. And when we talk about gender identity, it becomes jinsiyet kimni, which is again sex identity, and we are in this point that we started. So there is no way to express gender. And likewise, no differentiation between male and man, and no differentiation between female and woman and the language. So it's been hard for express themselves. So here comes Lubunja, a queer slang of Turkish. Uh, Lubunja is a historical term for uh, trans women sex workers and gay men sex workers, uh, very inside language to hide from police and cops and like any authorities. And the right, its origin back to Ottoman Empire is last years, and it has like approximately 500 terms. And it's kind of was a language for trans people to communicate in between us and make like themselves kind of invisible and hide and make their conversation unintelligible. So, as language is a living thing that is always changing and shifting with time, today Lubunja is not being used to hide. But people use Lubunja mainly for fun today and it makes a good contribution to LGBTQ plus visibility in society. So Lubunja acquired a new social function with the rise and emergence of LGBTQ plus activism and associations in Turkey. Lubunja today represents a symbol of belonging in the community and political flag of the movement. So many non-binary people start to use Lubunja as a sense of identity and expressing themselves their belonging in this community that challenging to navigate in Turkish. Uh, so, significance. I think this can be talked in many of the other research in today's, like, uh, today's panel and understanding the relationship between gender identity and language is a very interesting and very important thing and how language can affect our understanding of self is kind of the crux of the argument for me and Turkish material leading to the literature of transnational queer research. I forget to add this, but also creating some research that can be translated in Turkish for Turkish people is very important, especially for me and many non binary people living in Turkey. And questioning gender identities beyond language how can we can express them ourselves when there is not many words to express ourselves? In light of this, my future research, my ongoing research, that's kind of had a little pause with the earthquake, is going with like questions of how do non-binary people speaking Turkish and living in Turkey try to communicate to other people that they are non-binary, how do they convey their gender identity to others, and how do they use language to make their gender identity understandable to the people around them in their daily lives. So that's it. Thank you for listening to me.